You are looking at the scene in Columbus, where Ohio State is set to officially introduce Ross Bjork as the Buckeyes' new athletic director. Bjork will take over for the legendary Gene Smith, who is set to retire after nearly two decades as the leader of Ohio State Athletics. And with that, welcome you inside our Big Ten Network studio and this special Big Ten Live coverage of Ohio State's introductory press conference to welcome Ross Bjork as the school's new athletic director. I'm your host, Rick Pizzo, and we will take you to Columbus shortly, where Bjork, outgoing athletic director Gene Smith, and school president Ted Carter are expected to address the media and answer any questions regarding one of the most important positions in all of college sports. Gene Smith has now started to address the media in Columbus as we take you there to listen in. Listen, he served with one of my best friends at UCLA, Dan Guerrero, who was the athletic director there. So Ross has really been with some outstanding people. Uh, it would be a joy to work with Ross over my last five months to ensure a smooth and, and seamless transition. Uh, he's a fast learner and will quickly learn what it means to be a Buckeye. I want to welcome Sonia, Peyton, and Paxton to the Buckeye family, and there will be many remarkable experiences that you will enjoy. So thank you for coming here. Where are you guys at? Oh, there you are. Welcome to the hood. Uh, <laughs> And Ross has a couple other family members here, so I want to say hi to them, too. Welcome. Welcome to all of you. Uh, today is a great day for Ohio State and the Department of Athletics as we welcome this new leader. Uh, Ross inherits a department that is str as strong as ever. We have great coaches, great support staff, and, and student athletes that we serve are phenomenal. Uh, they're the best of the best. Uh, we're positioned. Uh, for increased success both now and well into the future. I've said this job has been the professional opportunity of a lifetime, and it has been. I feel 100% at peace because I know what Ross brings to this family. He's an outstanding leader, and I'm just so blessed and honored to have the opportunity to work with him over the next five months. But I will also share uh, that it's been a blessing and an honor uh, to work with our new president, uh, who understands intercollegiate athletics, obviously understands higher education, is, is an outstanding leader in this industry. So let me introduce to you our 17th president, Ted Carter. Wow, what a great day. Uh, welcome, Buckeye Nation. Welcome, everybody. As uh, Gene Smith said, uh, today is a great day for the Ohio State University. It's a great day for our student athletes. It's a great day for our coaches. It's a great day for the Big Ten. And quite frankly, it's a great day for all of collegiate athletics. I want to say a special thank you to Gene Smith. 19 years of service to this great university. 19 years. You cannot be in higher ed or in this business and not have somehow had the opportunity to touch and learn from Gene Smith, myself included. My first football game as superintendent of the Naval Academy, Gene Smith brought the Ohio State University to Baltimore, Maryland to take care of the midshipmen. I still will never forget it. Gene's exemplary leadership, he prioritized students, our athletes in the field, in the classroom, and in life. Buckeyes everywhere can be proud of what our student athletes achieved under Gene's guidance. Now, we're not saying goodbye to Gene just yet, um, and we'll have a chance to do that more, but as he said, we are positioned to continue operating at the highest level in collegiate athletics. Now, a lot of you know that uh, this is like my 17th day on the job, doing okay so far. Um, you should know that this effort to find our next director of athletics has been going on well before I got here. I want to say thank you to the Search Advisory Committee, led by Mike Eicher, Senior Vice President for Advancement and President of The Ohio State University Foundation. I want to thank former Board of Trustees member Clark Kellogg and former Senior Vice President of The Ohio State Alumni Association, Archie Griffin, both of whom lent their expertise as student-athletes and long-standing pillars of the Buckeye community. 
I want to thank uh, our board of trustees. Uh, we have a number of them here today. Uh, Pierre, you were part of this search uh, committee as well. I want to thank you for your service, a former D1 athlete here at Ohio State. Uh, they will formally approve this hire in February. That is uh, part of this process, uh, but their support has been instrumental in us getting to here. The success of Ohio State athletics is an important priority for our student athletes, our alumni, and all of Buckeye Nation. I am confident that our future is in great hands. But as I said before when I got here, there's no replacing Gene Smith. We did seek to find someone who could build on his legacy and position our student athletes to win, athletically, academically, and in everything they do. I want everyone to know that when I did these interviews for this vaulted position, I was looking for three things. The first, I was looking for somebody that could come in and be a leader in a complex space, a university that has 36 D1 programs, a thousand student athletes, a revenue stream of over $250 million. I need someone that could come in and understand this ever-changing landscape of collegiate athletics, name image likeness, potential revenue sharing, the changing landscape of conferences, expansion, expansion of college football playoff, and even NCAA structure and governance. And finally, as the Big Ten is going to 18 universities, that's 18 chancellors and presidents, 18 athletic directors, I needed somebody that could come in and carry the true weight of the Ohio State University and that locker room of athletic directors. And that person I found, Ross Bjork. Now, Ross has 30 years in sports administration. He's been all over the country. He's been at Missouri. He's been at Miami. He's been at UCLA as associate and uh, assistant athletic director. He was the youngest athletic director ever hired at Western Kentucky, part of Conference USA. He was also the youngest athletic director ever hired in a Power Five conference in the SEC when he joined Ole Miss. And now he's coming to us from Texas A&M. While at Texas A&M, he helped them achieve records in academic success and graduation rates. He worked with the Texas legislature and the NCAA to shape the NIL landscape and equip student athletes to navigate it. He oversaw one of the largest fundraising efforts in the history of Texas A&M athletics. He's demonstrated ability to lead through some of the most challenging moments our nation has faced in just the past few years. Gene and Ross are going to work really well together, and I'm really excited that they're going to have some number of months uh, to make an effective transition. And as you can see, with so many family members here from Ross, many of whom have really strong Ohio connections, what a, what a thrill to have his mom, Linda, who grew up on a farm right near Finley and has always enjoyed the Buckeyes and was a fan favorite of the best damn band in the land to Biddle. Welcome to Linda Bjork and your entire Bjork family. I think there's about 35 of you here, so welcome. I also want to give a special welcome to uh, wife Sonia, Peyton and Paxton. Really enjoyed meeting you. You're going to be a great fit here. Um, I just want to give a quick personal observation of uh, interviewing Ross so that you know that there is a strong connection between the two of us. Uh, Ross struck me as not only a leader, uh, but somebody who's passionate about sports, somebody who's a man that's been in the arena and experience like no other. He's relatively young, 51 years old. He's got a long runway out in front of him to be here and be our athletic director for a long time, like somebody I know named Gene Smith. So, Buckeye Nation, please join me and give a warm welcome to The Ohio State University's next senior vice president and Wolf Foundation, Eugene Smith, endowed athletics director, Ross Bjork. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to get a little uh, technology going here. OH. All right. Greetings, uh, Buckeyes. Uh, thank you, President Carter, for those very kind words and your introduction, your support, and your leadership through this process. I, I think I'm his very first hire here at Ohio State. So the goal will be not to mess it up for sure, but I'm really excited to join your team and join the Ohio State University. You have my pledge 
that I will work hard every single day for the Buckeyes, especially our student athletes, to make sure that we provide the best athletic and academic experience possible while adhering to the Buckeye core values and fulfilling the mission of this great university. Okay, some people just stood up when I got introduced, but we need to stand up for Gene Smith. The entire audience needs to give Gene Smith a standing ovation. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Gene, um, thank you for those, those remarks and uh, your friendship and your mentorship over the years. I first met Gene Smith in the summer of 1997. I was an entry-level development officer at the University of Missouri. He was the athletic director at, Ohio, at Iowa State, excuse me, Iowa State. And it was like, oh my God, there's Gene Smith. We actually get to meet him. He's actually gonna talk to us. And he's always been accessible. He's always been down to earth. And that's gonna be my job to make sure that I continue that type of legacy here at The Ohio State. The people, the tradition, the excellence. I'm humbled and honored to be chosen to serve as a senior vice president in Wolf Foundation, Eugene Smith, that's an honor right there, endowed director of athletics starting later this summer and to replace the legend Gene Smith. This may take me a while. I've got, I've got some thoughts here. I've got some comments and uh, those folks, if you're standing, uh, you know, bend your knees, be, be flexible up there. No, no one is just born into this enterprise of college athletics. So for our, our family and myself, this is a surreal feeling to be standing up here. We always tell our athletes to pursue their dream. For us, this is what dreams are made of. I, I, I simply wanted to work in sports. And entering college as a football player, I was going to be a high school teacher and a coach because that was the way that I only knew to work in sports. But you can't just wake up one day and say, I want to be the athletic director at The Ohio State or Texas A&M or Ole Miss or Western Kentucky. And going to college was probably not going to be an option for me. Um, I'm a first-generation college graduate, and because of athletics, I was given this, this great opportunity. I've been part of a football team or an athletic enterprise for over 40 years. Fifth grade tackle football in Dodge City, Kansas. So I'm, I'm really a product of this enterprise, and I'm grateful every single day. So we heard about family. So I wasn't born or raised in Ohio, but I'm a product of Ohio. So my mom, Linda, her family, they grew up on the, the Bame family farm just outside of Williamstown, to be specific. Does it have a stop light or a stop sign? I can't remember. I think it's just an intersection town, Williamstown, Ohio. And her side of the family moved to Ohio in 1851. Uh, Great grandpa, my great grandpa Bain built the family farm in 1908. John, am I getting this right? The family historian, my uncle. So all of these folks over here are Buckeye raised. All the Bain family, the Russ Meisels, the Bjorks, there's this great Buckeye connection. My mom worked at Marathon Oil Company in Finley and was getting transferred to Denver, Colorado. That's where she met my dad after he served in the Vietnam War. And they got married in the home church, Eagle Creek Church right there in Hancock County. They moved to Dodge City, started to go to work, raised a family. So here's the, de here's the deal. When you grew up in Kansas, we had two choices. Go to Denver with my dad's family or go to Ohio for the Bame family. Christmas, Thanksgiving, weddings, summer vacation. So if we came to Ohio, we'd find I-70 in Kansas and we'd drive the whole, t the whole way, no turns, until you got to Dayton, I-75 North. You found the Lincoln Highway and then there's several ways to get to Township Road number 30, where the farm sat. And it was really, this is kind of a, this, this all kind of comes back. So when you get closer to the farmhouse, you would actually kind of like slow the car down. Do you guys remember this? And then you would turn on the gravel road, and I still remember the sound of that gravel. Peace, family, it's like, oh, we got to the farm. We get to see Grandma and Grandpa Bame and all the cousins, and so uh, just a, a neat sort of family full circle moment. Lots of thank yous. Student athletes, are you, is any student athletes here? Is any student athletes here? I don't know if they could make it. Maybe there's a few that might be popping in and out. Uh, we've got athletic staff, coaches. I can't wait to work with all of you. President Carter, um, thank you so much for your leadership. The search committee, Mike Eicher as the chair. Um, 
interacting with Archie Griffin and Clark Kellogg, two legends, right, two Buckeye legends, uh, board of trustees led by Hiro Fujudi. Um, really thank you for his leadership. John Zeiger, uh, Pierre, thank you for serving on the search committee as well as a trustee member. Interact with Tom Matevsky and his family this week. Also Jeff Kaplan and Alan Stockmeister, all trustee members that I interacted with in the process. Tony Petiti, Big Ten Commissioner. Uh, we have not had a chance to speak. Uh, we've been texting each other and back and forth. He's in Big Ten meetings. Todd Turner, Collegiate Sports Associates. He was persistent in, uh, in calling me. Where is Katie Hall, Kim Lambert, and Ann Garcia? I don't know if they're here, but the transition team here, it is unbelievable. Like, this has never been anything that we've ever experienced. So Ann as general counsel, and Kim and talent management, and Katie in HR, thank you all so much. I want to thank the Texas A&M leadership team. I appreciate the Board of Regents, Chancellor John Sharp, but especially my boss, President Mark Welsh. He's a special leader. The 12th Man Foundation Board, coaches, staff, and the student athletes at Texas A&M. The, tw the 12th Man's the real deal. They care as much as any fan base in the country. And our goal was to make Texas A&M better than what we found it. And I'm really proud of what we accomplished. To my A&M friends and colleagues, especially head football coach Mike Elko, I get it. The timing in all of this is not good. What we just went through and more leadership turnover at Texas A&M, it's, it's not ideal and I fully understand the impact. Our family loves our time in Aggieland, and we have special bonds that will last a lifetime. It was an honor to work in the SEC for 12 years. I learned so many great leadership lessons from Mike Slive, the late Mike Slive, and I know Gene and Mike were close as well. And since 2015, Commissioner Greg Sankey, he's a true friend and a confidant, and that friendship will not go away. I look forward to really continuing to work together with the SEC to solve what lies ahead. Mentioned family, so I know my mom got introduced and Uncle John and Aunt Kathy. Aunt Kathy actually wrote me a Christmas note that I'm not gonna talk about yet, but maybe that story will, will come out later. Um, my sister Chris, her fiance Bruce, my niece Maggie Hobson and DJ and his wife Devin, they uh, were leaving actually them behind in, uh, in Texas. Uh, the NACTA staff, Pat Manick, CEO, Jason Galaska, what's your title now? Deputy, CEO, whatever. And then Bob Vecchioni, if you guys would wave, I'm a product of NACTA and uh, appreciate our National Association of Collegiate Ath Athletic Directors. Sonia and I met in uh, January of 1999, 25 years ago, later this month. We met at a restaurant, it was actually a bar, in Columbia, Missouri. And she told me she's a Missouri girl and she's never leaving. And I said, I'm going to be an athletic director and I'm going to move around. And if you heard my bio from President Carter, I moved around a little bit. And so this needs to be it. Please, trustees, please. President Carter, please. Let's be done. But Sonia is everything. I thank God every day for giving me her as my partner in this journey. Peyton, I, I tried not to cry, okay? Peyton's a senior in high school, uh, A&M Consolidated High School, a football player, first team all district. His team made the uh, Elite Eight of the Texas high school playoffs. He just signed to play football at Tarleton State in Stephenville, Texas. We actually have his official visit this weekend um, there in Stephenville. He's a slot receiver. He loves the game. He studies. He works. He focuses on the game. If you guys ever want to blame me for a decision, I probably had some consultation from Peyton. He grew up on the sidelines in the locker room. He gives me all kinds of advice. If you ever see us do this, that's for Tarleton State. If we ever wear a little bit of purple, that's their colors, so uh, Tarleton State Texans will be in his future, but thank you, Peyton. Paxton is our warrior. His grit and competitive spirit is unmatched. Like, this may be the hardest move on him. He's going into eighth grade, but his, uh, his talent and spirit will carry the day. He's the best athlete in the family. Soccer, basketball, football, maybe a little volleyball might be in his future, but he also gets straight A's. So he gives me advice on drip. So, and then as this Ohio State thing was coming together, he said, Dad, Ohio State has it all. It has, it has something to do with that Nike money. So he's a gearhead, uh, just like his older brother. So if we're not at a Buckeye event, 
We're going to be at Paxton's games, being a parent and cheering on him and his teammates. And then Sonia's going to probably be traveling to watch Peyton play uh, college football. So we're going to be divide and conquer for a little while. But why are we here today? This goes down as one of those trips that's really unexpected. It's part of the Bjork family journey that we didn't see coming. And as Sonia and I really kept looking at it, we, we really took a lot of deep uh, prayers, profound reflection on what is this really all about? And we kept coming back to this analysis. The bus for Ohio State Athletics only stops maybe once, if, if any. And we can't control that bus schedule. We can't control when it pulls over. And so the timing may not be ideal, but the, the stop is ideal for family and for family history. And if one move could be surrounded by all of this, this was it. Plus my mom, Linda, <laughs> If I would have told her six months from now, yeah, Ohio State called, and I would have been disowned from the family. So my mom made this come through. But why else Ohio State compete at the highest level? Be a leader in intercollegiate athletics in the future of all of this, right? Embrace high expectations. That's why we looked at this. The broad spectrum of responsibilities is not just athletics. You're a leader in this community in a, in a meaningful way, and it's more than just athletics. I respect Gene so much. I'll revere the honor of following him and then live in a great city like Columbus. So at the end of the analysis, the Ohio State University led us to here. So what does an athletic director actually do? Does anybody really know what an AD actually does? I think my kids think I give speeches and watch games. And it's a lot of that as well. But here's what I think an AD should do or can do to be successful. Drive the everyday culture. Develop your coaches and your staff to their full potential. Be involved in external relations and resource acquisition, all of it, from NIL to capital fundraising, resource acquisition. Student athlete well-being and life after sport. There is a future after sport, and we need to make sure we keep that in mind. And then we have to be teachers and educators. We don't have professors behind our name or PhDs necessarily, but we can teach and educate our young leaders. The vision for OSU athletics under our leadership, maintain but enhance the culture in the department, innovate but grow upon what Gene has established, showcase and enhance the student athlete experience, maintain but grow the academic profile if that's even possible, essentially don't mess that piece of it up. Cultivate meaningful relationships across all of Ohio State, Columbus, the state, nationally as well. Lead in the modern era. Be not afraid. Embrace high expectations. Win at the highest level. I get it. I know what we say, the school up north. I totally will get it, and every single day we will be ready and prepared. Integrity, education, people, excellence, respect, innovation, community, tradition. I don't have to bring any core values to this job. They're already well established. There are two things that we can control as an athletic staff, our attitude and our effort. How we think and how hard we work will carry the day. It's very simple. Nothing will work unless we do for the Ohio State Athletics. I always say that athletics is not the most important thing on a campus. It's not even close. And think about here at the Ohio State but we're the most visible. And really here, this is a public trust. This program belongs to the people of the state of Ohio. And with that comes great responsibility to do it the right way, no shortcuts, period. So I look forward to working with our athletic staff, our coaches. I told the coaches a, little bit, a few minutes ago that we have a get-to job. We get to come to work every single day to serve our student athletes, and they are the beginning and the end. Lastly, I'm gonna hit on the future of college sports. I've been talking way too long, and my kids are like, what are you talking about, Dad? Get off the stage. Here's what we have to do. Based on my experience, and based on where we are today, here's some bullet points. We must create a model that intersects sports and the academy, the education academy. We need a model that looks after each individual sport, our athletes, our recruiting calendars, and fair competition. We need to chart a new course for the financial arrangement, the financial agreement between the athlete and the institution. And we can call that whatever we want, but that's where we're going. We need to recreate that model 
period. It's past time to sit down with our athletes, understand what they want out of this experience, and some may call that bargaining, negotiating. It's called communicating, and it's called coming up with the right plan. We need to deconstruct and recreate the antiquated NCAA governance and divisional structure. At a minimum, there needs to be consolidation of the highest resource programs around a new financial and governance model. We either take action now or action will continue to be taken upon us. Enough conversations, enough lobbying, enough legal battles. It's time that we make a plan as an enterprise. And I look forward to locking arms with Commissioner Petiti and Ohio State and the Big Ten can lead the way along with the rest of our national colleagues. At the end of the day in this enterprise, if we take down our barriers, our silos, and get stuff done, like we, we can figure this out. So how do we create a legally defensible and sustainable model? College athletics, we are here to stay. We will still have games, we will have athletes, we will have education, and Buckeye Nation, I cannot wait to get started later this summer. It's gonna be a great, great ride. And OH, IO, thank you all so much. All right, we're going to open up the Q&A portion of this press conference. We're going to go about 12 to 15 minutes with President Carter. First of all, if someone over here on the left side could raise their hand, we'll get going on the left uh, uh, left side there, Nathan Baird, Cleveland.com. separated um, Ross from the other finalists. Yeah, so some of you couldn't maybe heard that question. When did I get involved in the interview process? And uh, maybe some more detail on what separated uh, Ross from some of the other candidates. Uh, obviously, uh, I've been the University of Nebraska system president until 31 December. Uh, I was in communication with uh, Dr. Peter Moeller as acting. Uh, I was kept informed of uh, how the uh, uh, search advisory committee was being put together. I didn't have direct involvement in that. Uh, they were often doing their job, so it allowed me to continue that effort. Uh, but from the day I started here on January 1st, I was deeply involved uh, in the search, uh, all the way to uh, some of the uh, final interviews and then another level of final interviews. Uh, simply stated, uh, I think I just need to say what Ross said to tell you how he separated himself from the rest of the candidates. Uh, he struck me as somebody that uh, has the values here at Ohio State. Integrity, passion, care for our students. And as I went before in my earlier comments, I was looking for those three criteria and I measured those against all of the candidates and he was by far the leader. It wasn't uh, you know, we had good candidates. I mean, we had a really wide range of candidates, as you might imagine, interested in this job. But Ross was a, was a clear winner in that, in that discussion. Okay, we'll move over to the right. Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Uh, President Carter, building on that question, uh, was Ross the clear recommendation of the search committee? And this is obviously your first major hire. Why do it so, so quickly? Yeah, so uh, a couple of points here to be made. Uh, first, the search advisory committee doesn't give me a ranking. So they just give me finalists, and then it's up to me to figure out uh, at that point. Uh, and of course, I did some consultation, a lot of back checking. Uh, and then if it looks like it, it's a little bit rushed, it's actually not. Um, you know, I want to be respectful for any of those that interviewed. If they happen to be sitting ADs, for those institutions have a chance to uh, go ahead and backfill those jobs. Uh, I also want to make sure that uh, whoever we selected had some really good overlap time with uh, Gene Smith to uh, be ready to come in here and, and go to work. Uh, over here to the left, Doug LaMaurice, Kings of Columbus. President Carter, I think you mentioned that you wanted an AD who could sort of carry the weight of Ohio State uh, in the Big Ten and, and nationally. What is your general philosophy on Ohio State wanting to exert its power in discussions in the conference and nationally versus when you want to be collaborative and work together as one of 18. What's your philosophy on that? Well, first of all, as you may know, in the Big Ten, we have a council of chancellors and presidents, and everybody has equal weight, uh, and that's the voting body within the Big Ten. The ADs certainly have uh, you know, influence 
And uh, I think the thing I would tell you first and foremost is I'm looking for alignment. Uh, not only what I bring into that uh, Council of Chancellors and Presidents, but how we are aligned together with the athletic director, with the coaches, uh, with all of our sports programs. I mean, as you all know, we are unique. 36 Division I programs. I mean, there's only a couple in the country that are even close to that, Stanford and, quite honestly, Navy. Uh, and there's an extra level of responsibility as this landscape is changing, you know, to be able to maintain that, be competitive, uh, take the care of our student athletes as Gene Smith has done with his circle of care and some of the programs, the Institute of Leadership he's created. I know that Ross is gonna continue on with not only that legacy, but in the room with everybody in all the different universities, some universities should have a little bit of different weight. And uh, this is not trying to be bigger than somebody else, but this university has been at the top of performance across all of our sports, all of our programs compared to our peers. Uh, and we won't necessarily have a bigger voice in there, but our voice should matter. Over to the right, Joe Nugent, WCMH TV. Hi, Ted. We're at a time where there's two major conferences in college sports. How much of his experience in the SEC for more than a decade played a role in the hire? Well, I would, uh, when you take a full look at the full spectrum, I mean, Ross talked about 40 years as a student athlete himself, but 30 years in, uh, you know, athletic director administration, that alone was impressive. I mean, he was in, you know, ACC, uh, Pac-12, uh, you know, the SEC, Conference USA, now the Big Ten. Uh, to have the amount of experience that he had in the SEC, and uh, after I had a personal talk with uh, Commissioner Sankey myself, as well as his president at Texas A&M, there was no doubt in my mind that Ross would have had a long career at Texas A&M and continued to be a leader in the SEC, and yes, that did make him attractive for this job. Back over to the left, Dan Hope, 11 Warriors. Ted, Ross just talked about how the NCAA needs to relook at its model and restructure. What is maybe your opinion, your stance on what the NCAA should do to restructure in a way that makes more sense for the athletes and the bigger schools? Yeah, I wish I could come up here and just give you the answer and draw a wiring diagram for you. You know, obviously there's going to be a lot of discussion. I agree with Ross in that the time is coming very quickly. Uh, the ability to operate Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, even FBS compared to uh, the Power Five or the A5 just in college football, uh, there's too much of a difference. And that there's gonna have to be some separation there. Uh, clearly conference realignment, whether we are pushing to do it or whether it's happening, and again, as Ross just pointed out, we either are part of that solution or it's gonna happen to us. So we are a large, powerful organization within the D1 athletic organization we should have a big voice in that, and we should be prepared to go into that. And that's why, as we were looking for who's gonna be the next athletic director here at Ohio State, we need somebody that not only has a vision, but's been in the arena, has been in it, and Ross has been on the NCAA compliance committees. He's a leader within the National Association of Athletic Directors, so he knows the landscape as well as anybody, and I'm really excited about that. Over to the right, Dom Tiberi, WBNS TV. You being a military man, sir, what is his marching orders from you, I guess? Yeah, it might surprise people that uh, I took that uniform off a little over four and a half years ago, so I don't give orders. Uh, I didn't actually give that many orders when I was in uniform. That's not how it really works. You get people to buy into the program. Uh, people that will get to know me better will know that uh, my leadership style is one of empowerment uh, and collaboration. And I'm really excited that to work with somebody like Ross where I will be able to empower him to do this work. But I also know that we're gonna work collaborative, collaboratively, not just you know, in the Department of Athletics here, but across our entire department. He pointed out that this is a large complex organization. We've got academics, we've got medical clinical care, we've got research, uh, we've got a broad spectrum of high mission areas, but athletics is a key part of it. So we're gonna to work together and it's gonna be really exciting. Uh, over to the left, Pat Murphy, 24-7 Sports. Thanks for doing this. Uh, Ross talked a lot about the Ohio connections. When you got that list of finalists you mentioned, how important was a connection to Ohio and kind of understanding what this university means to the state? I would say the connection to Ohio and understanding some of the culture, 
some of the traditions here uh, is a plus, not a requirement, it was a plus. I mean, I have to fully admit to you that I don't have a lot of state of Ohio connections. The Board of Trustees saw something special in me, and I'm, I'm a world traveler. My wife, Lynn, and I have lived in all over the world, all four corners of the country, in a lot of different places. Sometimes that experience uh, is what matters. And I can tell you, in my relatively short time being here in the city of Columbus, in the state of Ohio, this is an incredible state. Uh, I'll say right up to front to all of you, we have never been more welcome any place we've been. Uh, this was, I think, our 24th move that we've made in our lifetime. Uh, it was the best move we've ever made, not because of the ease of moving 500 boxes and a whole bunch of stuff into a house, but the way we were welcomed here. So I felt confident in my own experience coming here and how we would be welcomed that the requirement to have to be, you know, a connected person from the state of Ohio, not necessarily a requirement, a, a wonderful thing to have. Uh, and I see that as a tremendous positive. And I'm really thrilled for the family of the uh, Bjorks and their uh, lifelong history with the state of Ohio, I think it's a wonderful connection. Over to the right, Tim May, Letterman Row and the Tim May Podcast. Uh, thank you, President Carter. I was wondering, uh, in the interview process, how did Ross explain the Jimbo Fisher situation of getting a, uh, you know, a, an extension two and a half years, two years ago, and having to fire a guy in, a, in an unprecedented manner, you know, buyout like never seen before in college athletics? and. Where do you think that's taking college athletics? Go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, as you might imagine, I, I pressed that question pretty hard. I had a lot of questions about that. And uh, I'll just say right up front, uh, Ross has uh, owned it, uh, as has the institution. Remember, these things don't just happen in a vacuum, uh, even though he is the athletic director. Uh, he wasn't the original hiring authority. Yes, he did give an extension, and that happens a lot. I experienced that myself in Nebraska, so I understand that. Um, but here's what I will tell you, and a lot of people will have opinions about this. Uh, I've been around the block a long time. I've had my own lifelong experiences, uh, and in, I'm going to use a nautical reference here. As a lifelong sailor, a calm sea never produced a good sailor. So those that have been in the arena, those that have had to make those tough decisions, those that have been in it, they learn from that. Those are life lessons. And he'll bring that here. Uh, I, I don't expect we're gonna get into any kind of decisions like that here at Ohio State. And if we have to make tough decisions, whenever and however that'll be, it won't just be the athletic director making it. We have a wonderful board of trustees. He's got an office of the president. Uh, we're gonna work collaboratively. So, to get back to your original question, he answered that question satisfactorily enough for me to make sure that I knew he would be able to work well here. Over to the left, Spencer Holbrook, Letterman Row. Ted, Ross talked a little bit about alignment and how you guys can form that. How do you form that with a brand new president, a new athletic director, especially with the football coach and the men's basketball coach? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really important. And uh, you know, I kind of liken it to being in a, a three-legged race. You know, if anybody remembers doing that at carnivals, it's the first two or three steps that you gotta get exactly right. And once you get that, you can start to move a little bit faster and a little bit faster to the point where you're actually running, where you've got your two inside legs tied together. So we've gotta be able to make those first few steps, keep it simple, get the big things down together in alignment, and then the details will start to work out more easily. Uh, over to the right, Cameron Teague Robinson, The Athletic. I think everybody's mentioned Ross's ability to fundraise at Texas A&M. How important was that, especially in the NIL landscape and how much things are changing in NCAA? Well, first of all, uh, NIL, uh, name, image, likeness, I'd say we're still in the, uh, the early stages of it, and we're still learning a lot more about it. There's going to probably be more regulations put around that. I think that will tie eventually to what Ross was already talking about and whatever shared revenue models that will go uh, into the future. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, be able to ra uh, raise money for capital, uh, you know, uh, type of programs, capital events, campaigns, as well as being able to do things in the NIL space has to be done uh, appropriately and has to be done uh, in a way that uh, the biggest programs can survive. You know, as I look out over the landscape, I mean, just in the Big Ten today, uh, we're going to bring in four teams from the West Coast, 36 teams. We're going to be traveling four time zones. There's going to be extra cost to that travel. Uh, and if we do go to any kind of revenue sharing, the amount of revenue that we bring in today 
uh, is going to be a little more difficult. So managing the budget, managing uh, the future of fundraising and how we're going to be able to manage a program this vast and this big is going to take some imagination. It's going to take somebody that's got uh, the ability to show people what right looks like. And uh, I believe Ross is that man will be able to do that. Over to the left, Tony Girdman, Buckeye Huddle. The, the alignment and the NIL aspect of it, how, how aligned are you guys with like Charlie Baker's um, suggestion and, and those plans, and how do you feel about bringing the NIL stuff basically in-house and taking control of that? Well, again, I wish I could tell you the answer right up here at the podium. I think it's going to be a discussion. Uh, I'm going to be looking to Ross to help me better understand what the options are there. Uh, I read Charlie Baker's uh, uh, vision as like everybody else. I think it's a good way to start the conversation. I don't think that's how it's going to end up. Uh, and there's going to be a lot more happening here in the near future. We're going to take two more questions over on the right first. Rob Aller, Columbus Dispatch. Thanks for doing this, Ted. Um, a point of pride at this university is 36 varsity sports, but th that costs money. You've been talking about money. Has there been discussion of, of of changing that? Is, are, is that a tough decision that's going to arise, or are you, we are 36 and we're staying there? We're 36 Division I sports, and that's the way I'm tending to stay. Uh, now, can that change in the future? Of course. I mean, the dynamics of uh, where money will go and how it comes in, I mean, let's face it, there's two sports here, even at as great as we are, the Ohio State University that generate money, football, men's basketball. Uh, there are some other programs in the country where some other sports generate a little bit more. Uh, so we're going to have to think about revenue streams. Um, but I've been around the block long enough that uh, uh, I've always been, and I was a student athlete myself at Navy. Uh, I do not want to cut sports at all. And I've seen programs like Stanford and William and Mary go through that and then regret it and have to, you know, cycle back. Uh, I'd really like to not do that. So I'm going to stand here and tell you that we got 36 Division One sports here. You know, I refer to Gene and where we are today and Ross where we're going. But uh, my intention is to keep 36 Division One sports. Uh, Adam, Sheridan, either of you have a question? We have one more. So, uh, Adam Jardy, Columbus Dispatch. Uh, thank you. Uh, you talked about how uh, Gene and Ross are going to work really well together in these next five months. What, what does that look like if there are decisions that need to be made throughout the athletic department? Who makes those decisions and what would you like to see from a leadership standpoint while you have an athletic director and an incoming athletic director? Well, it'd be very clear line of delineation that Gene Smith is the athletic director here at the Ohio State University till June 30th. And on 1 July, uh, assuming that the Board of Trustees approves Ross's contract, that he will be the athletic director that next day. So Ross will be uh, learning from Gene, learning all the details and the ropes and the complexities uh, of what we're going to be doing here. Um, so that'll be simple. Uh, we haven't worked out those agreements right now. Ross still works for Texas A&M, so uh, that's work to be done. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm looking forward to having them both here on board. I think they're going to make a great team. But Gene will still be the boss until he, uh, until he steps away. And we'll be honoring him appropriately uh, as we get closer to June 30th this year. Any good decisions lie in any bad decisions. Right. <laughs> I, hope you all, I hope you all took that. Okay, I want to thank everybody for the good questions. We're going to let Ross come up here and uh, be able to take some questions as well. Thank you. Thank you. Who's, who's got it? I'll be, uh, I'm going to say something. Yeah. Okay, we'll open up questions uh, on the left. Uh, Adam King, WBNS TV. Ohio ties, but not necessarily to the Ohio State Athletic Department. So from an outside perspective, where do you see this university's department? What are your thoughts maybe the day before yeah. you applied for this job? Well, in, in college athletics, there's championship brands. There's sort of fighter brands that are trying to fight their way. Championship brand, period. And then you take the person in Gene Smith and the legacy that he has built. You take the championship pedigree and the facts that championships have been won here. You take the business side of it and in the enterprise, it's viewed as number one, number two, whatever, however you want to rank it, it's up there as the top athletic department. And then the, I know what the university stands for. The family's been re wearing Buckeye shirts around family reunion. So I know that if you're from this state, it doesn't leave you. 
So you understand that, the magnitude of it, and, and you have to embrace that, and that's, that's what we'll do. Over to the right, Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Welcome, first of all. Um, I Did think you text me? Did you text? You got my cell number? I think that was you. There's a few of you that texted me that obviously I didn't text you back. Did you get mine too? Somebody did. We could try. <laughs> Somebody got my cell number. I think that was you. Okay. Don't worry, it'll happen more. Okay. Uh, That's all good. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about relationship here. So. Uh, I, I think Eddie AD, who's done it for a long time, knows it's not all smooth sailing. Tim alluded to the yeah. uh, Jimbo <clears throat> Fisher thing. Can you address that situation and also your defense of Hugh Freeze at Ole Miss? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think one of the unique things about me, perhaps, is experience, but also the energy and kind of the prime of my life and career. So hopefully we get a little bit of both, the best of the both worlds. And that, you know, Jean was an AD since she was 28 years old. I think I was 37, and now I'm 51. So I think you take all those experiences and you basically say, okay, the bottom line as an athletic director, as a university as an administrator, is what is best for the institution. That's the number one filter. And then you take facts, you take data, you take some emotion, you take personalities, and then you make the right decision. So as we went through whatever it was at Ole Miss, whatever it's been at Texas A&M, you own those decisions. If they happened on your watch, maybe you were responsible and maybe you weren't. But at the end of the day, it's the Harry Truman quote, the buck stops here, I'm the AD. If anybody wants to blame anybody, blame me. So I don't know if I have time to explain the Coach Fisher transition. That takes a long time, but that was something that the institution wanted a commitment for high level football for a long time. There was a market condition that was gonna happen at the end of that football season in 21. There's somebody that was gonna be, there's gonna be an opening and they wanted security. It was my job to execute it. It was my job to make the right recommendations and the right structure. We did that. That was approved by university leadership. And I'm the one who executes it. And I'm the one who's responsible at the end of the day. And so those are the things we went through. And that's how we made decisions every single time. Over to the left, Spencer Holbrook. Did you have a follow up? The you free stuff? Look, he, we, we went on facts. You, you could say whatever you want about perception or whatever, but the facts are a compliance record was really strong in terms of day to day. There was a lot of outside forces. There was a lot of outside forces that infiltrated. And, but as far as the head coach, we knew exactly what was happening from a compliance standpoint. And then he had a personal failure. And as soon as we found out about it, we took action and said he cannot be the head coach anymore. And that was a very, very direct decision that, again, it happened, but how do you deal with it, to me, is more telling than the thing that may have happened behind that. Spencer Holbrook, Letterman Row. Ross, when you take one of these jobs like this, there we are. Okay. When you take a job like this, how do you evaluate head coaches, um, and how do you instill confidence in them while also knowing that you're not the athletic director who hired them, but also form relationships yeah. with them. You know, people always look at it like, well, he, you know, that's not your coach or you didn't. It's the institution that comes first. So I'm going to lean in on Gene over these next five to six months. I'm going to understand the dynamics and the culture. The, the number one thing that I can do is get to know the people because that teaches you about the culture. Before you come in with some wild game plan or I've got this and this is going to be a magic bullet for whatever it might be. It doesn't work that way. You have to get to know the people, you get to know the place, which teaches you the culture. So I'll learn a lot from Gene. And then eventually, it's me. I'll formulate my decisions and there's lots of ways to evaluate coaches. What I'll do first is get to know them. Are there any barriers to success? What are the challenges right now? Is there momentum in the program? in whatever categories you know, those might be. So we'll, we'll just sit down and learn. I don't know anything about fencing. I don't know anything about field hockey yet. So I've got a lot to learn about other sports that are here that I can't wait to, to really understand. So that, it's gonna be a learning process. And the way we're doing this transition is so helpful where the bad decisions are actually Gene and the good decisions are mine. Um, but I'll, I'll be able to learn a lot between now and uh, June 30th. Back over to the right, Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. 
Ross, just curious, your general and early impressions of the football program. Um, have you had a chance to meet Ryan Day? And just what do you think you can bring to the football program from an administrative level, be it staffing, facilities, those sort of things? Yeah. No, uh, Coach Day and I spent uh, about an hour together on, uh, on Monday as part of the, the meeting process uh, to finalize everything. Obviously, I, I didn't know him personally, but know a lot of people. We have a lot of similarities in terms of crossover. Uh, Brilliant mind in the game of football, high level leader, knows what championship football looks like, knows how to put all of those pieces together. We get it, <laughs> the game matters. And so he and I talked about that. And, and the best thing that I can do is lock arms with him, figure out are there any barriers, figure out key decisions. He's the coach, he's the strategist, he has to build the roster. And it's my job to say, what are the infrastructure pieces? What are the culture pieces that I can help you with? And then let him go to work. And by all accounts, those things are all coming together. So I know him and Gene have been locking arms on, on key changes. And I'm here to help in whatever I can do in that realm while they make those decisions. But I'm a football guy. I'm going to help. And I'm going to make sure that, again, we compete at the highest level because the pedigree is here. And then if I really need help, then uh, Peyton and Paxton uh, will help me with uniforms, most likely. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I, this guy right here, I mean, Coach Day, he's going to get it done. And it's going to be a lot of fun when we win those championships. Oh. Over to the left, Andy Backstrom, Letterman Rowe. Russ, what makes a good fundraiser in your eyes, and, and what challenges do you expect to face at Ohio State fundraising versus you know, the ones you faced at Texas a and I used to give a speech uh, as part of NACTA about the difference between fundraising and development. And back in my fundraising days, it, it's really not that hard. If you're organized, if you're accessible, if you lay out a vision, typically you don't have to ask. The donor typically says, wow, I really like that. What do you need? And then there's technical proposals and things like that, but it's all about the relationship. And then our job is to activate their passion, whatever that might be, through discussion, through stewardship, through cultivation. There's all kinds of technical terms around it, but it's really about, do you have a relationship? Do they trust you? Do they see a vision? Clearly they have the wherewithal. That's, that's a part of it. You study all of, all of that. And then it's, it's their decision on where they like to give, and it's our job to, to really steer them. But it's people. That's, that's the part that's not hard, is it's about the people and building those relationships. Over to the right, Rob Aller, Columbus Dispatch. Ross, you are no stranger to passionate fan bases. There's, there's a lot of noise out there, positive, negative, aimed at you. Aimed really? At, well, as an AD, there, as an oh, AD, okay. oh, just as an in AD, general, in general. Oh, okay, okay, in general. Okay. Well, Gene didn't tell me about that part <laughs> at coming here. Also, football and basketball right. coaches. How do you separate legit feedback from the social media mob mentality, essentially? Well, it, you have to look at it. is uh, is is social media real life? I don't know. For my kids, maybe they see a lot of things. They're on TikTok right now, I think. Um, you know, one of, I think one of the things, you, it's a balance. It's all about, everything's a balance, right? And so is there something real that's out there that you have to follow up on? Do you have to check out, right? How many, uh, how many message board situations do we have here? Three or four here at Ohio State? How, how many? 30 to 40? Okay, okay. Sorry, I needed to add a zero on that. You know, so there's people that can monitor those kind of things to see if there's something that, that gets out of hand. But again, at the end of the day, if we say it's about the institution, it's about our values, it's about making the right decisions in the betterment of the program and for the student athletes, if I make people mad, that probably means I made the right decision. If I made people happy, it probably means I make the right decision. So I have a, I have a saying, and I learned this from Dan Guerrero, who uh, Gene mentioned, the uh, AD at UCLA, never too high, never too low. We're always going to be measured. We're going to celebrate when we need to. But it's probably never as bad. It's probably never as good. And then the social media stuff is probably more on the extreme where it's the bad. And then you just live in it and deal with reality as much as you can. Quick follow-up. You 
you received some blowback at A&M with the Stoops thing. Do you feel like you have the autonomy here and you're going to have the freedom to, to you make that decision on something like yeah. that? Here, here's what people, they don't really realize about the process. The athletic director and the team, whatever that may look like, we, we run a search process. We make recommendations to the president. I would like to hire this person, or I think this is the number one candidate. That's how it works on every institution. No athletic director has the full autonomy to say, I'm absolutely gonna hire this person and no one else is involved. That's where it goes back to alignment. That's where it goes back to process and communication. So how that name got out there, of course he was a candidate, but we didn't hire him. We hired Mike Elko and Mike Elko is a great coach and we're gonna meet them in the playoffs because he's gonna build it. So at the end of the day, who did you hire and how did you get there? That's what matters the most. So searches in today's world are really, really probably uh, unrealistic in terms of because of social media, because of plane tracking, because of whatever. And so that's what you have to do is just go through a process and, and pick the right person. And that's what we did. Over to the left, Nathan Baird, Cleveland.com. Yes, sir. Um, you've been asked several questions about NIL today. I think going back a couple of years, a lot of Ohio State fans were uh, looked at Texas A&M with a lot of envy for what they perceived to be happening there with access to that kind of money. I think they then looked at it with a little bit of amusement as to how that turned out a couple of years later with guys going in the portal and, and that process not really seeming to work out. So I guess what is your strategy for um, – replicating, I guess, the success of having that robust program in place, but also be at a place where maybe the, the booster culture is very different and there's a there's different tolerance mm -hmm. level for some of those activities. Yeah. You, you said a lot of key words in there, envy, perception, right, sort of outcomes. No one really knows what reality really is in the NIL space unless they're on your campus and they're turning in the contracts to your compliance office, which which is a healthy part of any NIL program. So. That's reality, right, is what, what happens on your campus. We don't really know what's happening across the country, and that's one of the challenges that we have here. So what I would say in the NIL space is today's leaders, today's coaches, we have to get the culture right first. That's going to still matter. Team culture, team chemistry, and then there has to be a structure around NIL. The players know who's the most valuable player. They know who's going to make the most money because of who they are. So if there's structure within your organization, if there's constant communication about value, if the coach is building culture and there's a lot of communication, people shouldn't have to like hide around their locker room and say, hey, what's, what's that person getting or what's that person getting? The best players are gonna thrive. Other players should be able to be accommodated as well. And so if there's communication, if there's a plan, those are all the aspects that I believe in. I can't wait to see how it works here and see what the dynamics are. And eventually, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a hub within the athletic department where everything just funnels into one hub. And that may be some of the revenue that comes into that hub, and then it may go out. If we can build the infrastructure the right way to model this out for the future, that's what I'll look at. That's what I'll study when I get here and learn more about. And like I said earlier, revenue generation, revenue acquisition, we have to embrace all of it. NIL to buying a t-shirt and everything in between is something that we will embrace heavily and we will get after it. Over to the right, Cameron Teague Robinson, The Athletic. Ross, t Ted mentioned a lot about t how much you'll be able to learn from Gene mm -hmm. in the next few times. Kind of what do you want to learn the most from Gene and how will you juggle that with your responsibility still at Texas A&M? <clears throat> well, uh, what, what you'll see in um, President Carter mentioned a little bit about the transition. You'll probably see me a little more around after March the 1st, uh, where I can start coming to events and, and seeing activity. And again, it goes back to really what I said earlier about just, I just want to learn the people. I think that's the most important thing. Get to know the people. And luckily, I don't have to make the key decisions, the day-to-day -day decisions. I can really, really soak myself in and learn all about this place. Uh, but I, I'm going to study whether it's contracts, whether it's personnel contracts, the Nike contract, the Learfield contract. I uh, have a great relationship with Levy, who's the concession and hospitality partner. I want to see what that contract looks like here at Ohio State. So there'll just be a lot of 
a lot of studying, but again, it's all going to be about interaction with people. Um, I've got a few relationships among the staff and a few among the coaches, and we'll uh, capitalize on those, and I'll be back and forth. And there's a lot of kids' activities in the spring. Uh, high school graduation, Peyton's getting inducted into his high school Hall of Fame, Paxton plays seven on seven and soccer. And so I'll be, uh, I'll be visible, but also be able to, to kind of learn in, uh, in the right manner. Over to the left, Dan Hope, 11 Warriors. Russ, to follow up on what Ted was asked before about 36 varsity sports, how sustainable do you think that is in a model where revenue would potentially be shared directly with athletes? Well, what, what you're going to see is you're going to see some sort of reallocation of the budget, and hopefully you can grow that budget. There's new revenue streams that are coming, right? College football playoff. Again, we, we want to capitalize on all the categories here on this campus. And I think what you'll look at is you'll see what some of the national standards might be. Are there some Big Ten standards? But the goal is, like President Carter said, 36 sports. We, we owe that, again, this is a public trust. We owe that to the people. We owe that to our athletes. We owe that to our fans to say we want to compete in the highest level at everything. It may look different. It may be reallocated different. It may be structured different. But we have unbelievable facilities. Those aren't going to set empty, right? We have unbelievable infrastructure that's been built that allows us to have this foundation where we can, we can be a broad-based program for sure. But no one. What's king? Football, right? Other revenue sports. We, we got to acknowledge that. And that's the great thing about here. There's a healthy culture that understands that, and we can capitalize. Over to the right, Clay Hall, WSYX. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, you said you're a football guy. What do you think of Big Ten football compared to the places you've been? And it's a two parter. Do you see the Big Ten and the SEC beginning to? They're already super conferences. Do they take over this thing? <clears throat> I guess I'll think better of Big Ten football on July the 1st. Right now I'm still employed in the, in the SEC. Um, I, I think it's great. I think the healthy competition is awesome. Clearly there are two leagues who have distinguished themselves uh, by far from an exposure. We, Gene and I were talking about the TV ratings from this past year. It's the Big Ten and the SEC. So there's no doubt that it's going that direction. Uh, what I think of Big Ten football is uh, it, you know, success, tradition, cold. So I don't think I've, I've wore a parka at a football game in a long time. Um, so I know I'm going to have to do that as well. But really just embracing, I, there's stadiums I haven't been to. I haven't been to Happy Valley. I haven't been to Penn State. I've never been to a game there. I haven't been to Wisconsin. Um, so I'm looking forward to going to those venues and embracing all of that. Um, there's not a lot of fullbacks still left, but there's a few Big Ten programs that run a fullback. So I told Coach Day on Monday, can you put a fullback play in? Actually, I didn't. I didn't tell him that. Um, but maybe I'll start on July 1st about uh, putting some fullback plays in there, at least a, like a trap play or something, maybe. So, But the SEC, look, here, here's what's going to happen. It goes back to what I talked about, consolidation of the highest resource programs. And who is that? This coming year, the SEC and the Big Ten will be 34 programs. So that's half of the Power Five, right? So we are the two leaders, our conferences are, and we'll have a seat at that table. Again, great thing, Commissioner Sankey, great relationship. Tony Petiti, we'll have a great relationship. And I think we have to shape it and we have to monitor what's going to happen within the landscape and TV contracts and the NCAA proposal, college football playoff expansion. People are going to go around the room. At the end of the day, they're going to ask the Big Ten and the SEC for the last word. And that's just the way it is right now. Don't know. I, I think what you have to monitor is what's happening in the ACC. Look at those timelines. I think you have to monitor these legal cases that are happening right now, especially the ones in California. And those trials start in the early 2025. So you have to monitor what's happening in, in Congress, of course, and we're going to continue to work on those efforts. You have to. You can't give up on that, even though the court cases may come first. You can't give up on the federal legislative approach, and I've already had conversations here on campus about that. How soon? I would say in the next three to five years, there's going to be some major tipping points 
and what that looks like and exactly when will be, uh, we'll be at the forefront of those discussions. Folks, we have time for just a couple more questions. We'll go back to the left here. Doug LaMaurice, Kings of Columbus. Ross, I think we could have a five-hour conversation yes. about the future of sports we'll here do that. what you're we'll saying. We'll do that when I get back. Are you in favor of football breaking off in some form with the highest resource universities and programs? I think the first question to that is, what does that mean? Does that mean playoff? Does that mean money? Does that mean TV rights? Does that mean playing rules? What do we want out of that, that goal if that would be the goal? So I think we have to look at it as the highest resource institutions are different. And finally, the NCAA acknowledged that. We have a leader in Charlie Baker who has at least acknowledged that as a starting point. All the programs over $100 million budgets were different. But if you just take football, what does that mean for every other sport? How do you schedule? How do you travel? What's the regional aspect of it? I know one thing, <clears throat> that universities want education tethered to this. So if we say we're, we're separate in football, again, what does that mean? And so to me, it's the highest resource institutions can house a lot of these key elements, financial, player relationships, player negotiation. That's the model that we have to get to. What that looks like, how that works is going to be determined. And so you don't really say, let's break off football. Let's have a czar of football. There are things that we can do actually right now that doesn't take a czar. We can clean the recruiting calendar up. We can clean the transfer windows up. We can get our coaches maybe off the road in, in December because they need to be worried about roster retention. There's things that we can do right now within the structure where you don't have to break away football. That would be really, really easy, but we got to get it done. And that goes back to the whole governance model where things get stuck because everybody gets in their silos and we got we to take those down. Sports are different north and south, I think. I think there are some cultural things maybe. This is big-time athletics here at the highest level at Ohio State. But I'm just curious, you're not a Big Ten expert right now. You've been in the SEC mm -hmm. for more than a decade. Do you believe that this job is similar to your jobs in the SEC, or would you believe there are a lot of differences at a place like Ohio State compared to Texas A&M or Ole yeah. Miss? I always, I always say, look, a job in the SEC and, and really the Big Ten are not for the faint of heart. So I think the, the magnitude and the visibility and the attention and the social media blowback that he was talking about, those fundamentals are going to be very, very similar. And there are marquee brands, if you will. There's championship brands in the SEC that maybe are a little bit different. A&M, maybe we're a little bit of a fighter brand and we're trying to work our way through you know, some of this. So the fundamentals of that are the same, but this job in particular, there's not one like it. The state, the entire state, public trust, public accountability. You have to make sure you have the wherewithal. I always say, I said it when we hired the football coach at Texas A&M, somebody better have the chops to handle this. And so you better have the chops to handle this particular job. One, you're following a legend. Two, it's the scope and scale. So similarities in terms of maybe some of the fundamentals, but I know that this is the largest fan base in the country of any athletic program, and there's data that speaks to that. So we'll dive into that. We'll embrace that. It'll take a lot of time. It'll take a lot of communication. It'll take a lot of visibility, and uh, you'll, see, uh, you'll see our family being a part of that, so I'm, I'm ready for it. Uh, over to the right, Joe Nugent, WCMH. Youngest athletic director at Western Kentucky, the youngest in Power Five at Ole Miss. Where did your drive come from, and why do you think it led you here? Probably just, honestly, just family, family roots. And I just, just the game, the sport, whatever it was, just the, the competition of it. Again, I, I played Division II football. I played fullback, and it, my job was to basically go hit that guy and to go hit that guy. There wasn't a lot of creativity. It was pretty simple to just go knock that person out. And so when I see something, when, I, when I, I'm inspired by something, I just want to go get it done. And I made $600 a month at Western Kentucky in the summer of 1996. I got a job at the University of Missouri in 1997, and I thought I hit the lottery. I was making 18500 
When I met Sonia, she looked up my salary in the state salary book, and I had gotten a raise to 20, I think it was $20,000. And I'm like, man, she still likes me, and I make $20,000. So it's never been about the stage, the money, the value of the enterprise of a university that we've worked at. It's been about, can you make a difference? Can you serve and lead others? Can you be impactful maybe on a broad scale? I would have been the AD at Emporia State, and maybe they'll call me someday uh, when, I, when I retire from Ohio State and, and be involved with the, the Hornets. That's all I wanted to do was work in sports. So the drive is just internal. I was given something. You know, my dad was in the car business for 45 years. He worked six days a week. We didn't do much because he worked six days a week. And it was always, when could we get off on vacation to go on a trip, to go see family? So it's just an internal drive, and I just love this. We have a get-to job that we wake up every single day for. Over to the left, Tony Gerben, Buckeye Huddle. Yes, sir. Um, the, you mentioned the tipping point in three to four or five years. Are you looking forward to that? Well, here, here's the thing. Um, uh, at Texas A&M, we have an administrative leadership team, and we talk about these things all the time. And uh, one of the questions was, what are, you, what are you sort of looking forward to the most? And I said, clarity. Let's, whatever it is, let's get there. And we've, we've been so reactive as an industry. And Gene's been a part of it way more than me, where we react. I, mean, I remember when we had a $2,000 uh, proposal on the table and everybody freaked out before cost of attendance came into play. We always restricted scholarships up to cost of attendance. Hey, let's do a $2,000 stipend. Oh, we can't do that. Whatever it is, let's have clarity of the model, clarity of divisions, clarity of the revenue between the athlete and the institution. Let's have clarity because all of this confusion and all what we're putting our coaches through right now with rosters and transfers and NIL, that's not sustainable for them as a human being. Let's get to clarity. Let's have a model that's legally defensible. And so that's what I'm looking forward to. Let's get there. Because we, if we get stuff done, we can get there. Last two questions. They'll both come from the right side. Tim May, Letterman Row, Tim yeah. May Podcast. Thank you. Uh, Ross, uh, I asked uh, uh, President Carter about the uh, – the Jimbo Fisher situation, just because it was so unique right. in a lot of ways. Uh, where, where do you see, like, coaches' salaries going? I mean, we just saw yeah. Alabama have an opening, and it got, like, five guys raises or extensions, you know, country and stuff. And uh, where, do, where do you see that going? I mean, there has to be a stopping point, I would think, at some point from a financial situation. <clears throat> I think we can look more at incentive-based, performance-based contracts. Maybe you're seeing that come to fruition a, a little bit. Um, I, I know we – did that at, at Texas A&M, focused on the 12-team playoff, right? So I think you'll see some of that come together. But at the end of the day, that side of, of our business is market-driven, and everybody wants the best coach, and sometimes there's going to be market factors involved in that. So it all goes back to the key word, the balance. Who can you get? Who's your program? What are the resources? But I don't think you're going to see – 10-year, fully guaranteed, I think those days are going to be waning more. And again, as we get back to what is the revenue reallocation piece of this, I think you'll see some level setting on that. But if they're talented, there's going to be market for that. And if we have the wherewithal, then we're going to do what we need to do to be successful. Uh, right next door, Dom Tiberi, WBNS. You talked about the importance of the football program. Um, did you have an awareness, or you, you know about the team up north, right? Who? <laughs> yeah, I got you. What, team up? Yeah. Is you, it the school can, up north? Is it the team up north? It's, it's all that. Okay. It's the team, okay. It used to be the school. Yes, full, fully. I mean, again, if you grew up a football fan, I grew up in southwest Kansas, and it was typically Oklahoma, Nebraska on TV at the end of the year and it was Michigan and Ohio State, and it was USC, UCLA. Those are the games that were on TV back then when I, when I grew up. And so full of, and then obviously, again, the family. If you follow my mom on Facebook, she has more posts about Ohio State than Texas A&M. 
So of course, I'm aware of the game. Great. Ross, thank you yes. very much. Yes, President. absolutely. Thank you all so President much. Carter, Appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Media, thank you for yeah. attending. Thank you. I think that was good going long. I know that was a little long, but let's be. Let's Boy, there was a lot to unpack there as the Buckeye family does officially welcome Ross Bjork as the ninth athletic director in program history. He will take over for Gene Smith on July 1. That's when Smith officially retires and Bjork takes the reins. You look at the resume in addition to his most recent job at AM, where there was a lot of publicity about the firing of Jimbo Fisher in that $76 million guaranteed contract. Bjork spent 15 years between AM, Ole Miss, and Western Kentucky. AM has done great things in the Directors' Cup. That looks at all sports school wide, finishing in the top 25 in the last three years under Bjork. You heard President Carter talk about the importance of Bjork's Ohio connections. Ross himself mentioned those family connections as well throughout the course of his press conference. And like Gene Smith before him, of course, Gene Smith was teammates with our football analyst Jerry Donardo at Notre Dame. Bjork was also a college football student athlete. He played fullback at Emporia State University in Kansas. We are not done with our coverage of the hiring of Ross Bjork. Stay put. Take a four-minute break. When we come back, it is today's edition of Big Ten Today. Much more on the Ohio State decision and others coming your way right after this.